We're going to talk about the, uh, the Oregon Group Hub Law, which is what made, what made Oregon into the best beer country in the world. So we're going to start um, with uh, Dick Ponzi, who, um, who uh, founded, um, founded Bridgeport. And um, I want to know why did winemakers start the Oregon Craft Beer? I mean, what's up with that? I mean, winemakers, we know they're snooty, you know, but well, you, you and Charles Curry. You know, John, it, it takes a lot of beer to make good wine. <laughs> That's not an original statement. <laughs> So, but um, um, uh, tell me, tell me how you got into how how you guys came to start Bridgeport, uh, which was what Columbia Brewing, Columbia. We we had many different names. That was one of them. But you know we have to give Brian and Mike a lot of credit because they got me hooked on to good beers. Um, when Mike was importing a lot of good beers and we'd have beer tastings, you know, that was kind of an odd thing, but, and had a lot of fun doing it. <coughs> and so, from my personal standpoint, that's where I got the bug. And uh, Mike and I were this close to doing a brewery, uh, the first brewery. and. Uh, and we kind of <coughs> went our ways. But then that bug of making a good beer was, was always in my mind. And, uh, but it was being generated by good beers coming in. Uh, unfortunately, not fresh beers, but at least beers that we could taste with flavors and have some idea of what good beers tasted like. And, uh, and then there was Cartwright Brewing which uh, showed that you could make a product and there was some discussion, you know, how great the product was, but it, it was a, a, an effort to bring fresh beer to Oregon. And, uh, and that wasn't quite so successful, but it did perpetuate the idea that we could make good beer here. And then we went to the uh, uh, the amateur beer brewing group to get some kind of support to see that there was a real desire to to have our own beers in Oregon and they were very supportive so we just jumped in and the thing that intrigued me was the the process and the eventual product but the process was a little more complicated than winemaking but it was intriguing to me as a, my background being in engineering. So we had to scrounge and weld and put together the whole brew house and the tanks and whatever we could scrounge together. And obviously the Widmers had to do the same thing shortly afterwards. But it was proven that we could make beer, we could make good beer, and uh, we had the we had the resources right over the river, and so we had the hops nearby. It was unnatural for this to happen because we had um, we had big breweries in this area. We had um, we had Blitz, um, we had Lucky across across the river. Right. Um, so we had Maltsters. We had the infrastructure, exactly. but we just had you know those kind of those kind of pallid beers. Who, um, who among you guys actually went to Koori? Brian, I think, didn't, oh, weren't, yeah. weren't you there? Oh yeah, and it yeah. was, uh, I didn't know him very well, Mike knew him better, but uh, he was a really smart guy, uh, eccentric, but really, um, I mean, he was doing stuff that hadn't been done, but it was scary watching that beer get made. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it was, you know, it, in the old buildings, you have there's stuff like yeah. lead paint that yeah. it's open for renters. I don't know what I've, that does to beer, but probably not what you desire. I've heard, I've heard the phrase unintentional Belgian. Yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of that. 
So it was, you know, he, there, there was there, there was some good beer that, that came out of there. Sure. Beer, and there was a lot of bad beer. But you know what? I think uh, we can all say here that we had good beer and bad beer. Um, you had to experiment. You had to. Yeah, had to give it a try. So, I mean, he he inspired you guys, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I went through you. Yeah, and we, it was more than inspired. We were wildly enthusiastic. Uh, my friend Jimmy Goodwin and I uh, about this fact that somebody was uh, doing uh, that kind of beer uh, locally. I wish it had been better. <laughs> uh, he was. Uh, I mean, one thing he did wrong was he didn't consider the fact that he might have been able to do draft beer and not bottle it. But he was bottling the beer under conditions that weren't really uh, suitable for beer. And uh, with an old soda bottler and the, the product just... And he, he, was, he was recycling, he bought, I think he was collecting Guinness bottles and bass bottles and, and maybe not cleaning them as well as they should have been cleaned, I'm not sure. But, uh, the, the beer that came out of the bottle, it may have been better when it went in, but we never had the chance to try that. Uh, the beer that came out of the bottle was uh, disappointing, uh, and, and we wanted it so much for it to yeah. succeed and, and to like it, because we were just enthusiastic about what he was doing. But he did, he did uh, give us all, I think, uh, the the news that it could be done. Uh, we just needed to do it better. Yeah. And I think we all did. Well, and I think uh, what, what inspired Rob and I, we were just fledgling home brewers at that point, but we went and saw the, the Cartwright operation. And But more than that, um, I mean, we're not engineers or anything, but we can see where he could have maybe improved his process. But uh, what we took, the inspiration we took was seeing how many uh, retailers around Portland also really wanted him to see that uh, succeed. Um, I mean, people really, really wanted this to happen, and, and Ram and I were like, damn, you know, all you have to do is do it right, and, and there's a market for it. Yeah. Well, that was early. That was 1979, right? Yeah, yeah, 1980, yeah, somewhere in there. Fred, don't you have a receipt from a... I do, I have a receipt. He, when he was uh, uh, on his way out, uh, he, he uh, brewed some beer that he called Deliverance Ale. And, uh, and no banjo music in the background, please. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I think he felt that he was going to uh, be able to sell this. And he was selling it by subscription. So uh, I, uh, I bought a case of it. I never collected it. I understand that, the, uh, that there were cases of beer for sale or that could be collected uh, if he had a receipt at his... Uh, uh, tax auction, right? And uh, I, I didn't hear about that, but I still have the receipt, which may be worth more than the beer was, anyway, so. or it may taste better. <laughs> <laughs> we have to. Um, if you go to, just to say, John, if you go to a Barney Mill uh, pub named yeah. after the Barney Mill, right? Which was the mill that yeah mm -hmm. he used in his brewery, and um, to continue the story, it was actually. From a, a kitty litter mill. <laughs> I mean, kitty litter. So we use it once a year for, uh, an, you know, just for an anniversary purpose. It came from, yeah, so it, it goes to show where, where it's I, coming from. And, and I have to say, I, I had to, to uh, grind a bucket of grain in that mill, mm -hmm. and it is. Fussy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> and all those McMenamin's brewers used to have to do that in their first uh, part of their brew day. Um, so, you guys, uh, uh, whoever wants to, set the scene. I mean, we're, we're in like the best beer city in the world, but like 30 years ago, it was not. Uh, how many imports were there? How many breweries were there? Who wants to talk about that? I'll just say something about uh, when we were trying to analyze if we had a market or not, we would go look at the oil CC report that still comes out, and I think we all looked down at the bottom where it had imports. We never thought our business would come out of Weinhardt's or Rainier or Lucky or Olympia or our local yellow beers. We were all looking at our imports down here, and that's been the biggest surprise for me to look back retrospectively for 30 years. The imports have grown. The big boys have shrunk, and we've come into the middle. Now, if we would have prophesied that 30 years ago, 
Nobody would have been drinking our beer. They probably would have thought we drank too much of the beer. <laughs> the other thing that's astounding to me is if we could have written a script, we would have written a script that said, close up Weinhardt, close up Lucky, close up Rainier, close up Olympia. <laughs> it happened. If we would have asked for it, it happened. It wouldn't have happened. It's a Hollywood script that came true. We all drink locally, but these decisions to close these breweries up were made by somebody in South Africa or Belgium or South America, some other place that made this decision, not knowing that think local, drink local. How, many, how long have we heard that? That's something that's gone on for years and years and years. Like Fred is, used to say to us that Prohibition kind of interrupted this craft brewing scene that started in the early 1900s. Right. And it took us quite a while after World War II and after the Depression to come back because only the big boys survived. It took a long time for the small craft brewers to kind of start infiltrating the market. So, you want to expand on that? Well, just, uh, it's true what you're saying, but on the other hand, there was a problem and a major problem, I thought, in terms of marketing these beers. We had our following. And we had people who made their own beers, and they knew what beer could taste like, good beer, and the import beers. But when you get into the marketplace, it was you're competing with these watered-down, very cold beers, and people were really looking at what we were trying to sell at maybe twice the cost, and trying to figure out why would anybody do this. You really had to be a a, uh, a, a follower of what was happening and what the brewing industry was doing in other parts of the world. So I think the marketing led up to probably the legislation because we always pitched it at Bridgeport that we should have a system like the wine industry. You should have a tasting room. You should be able to make your beer and show people what you had and serve it to them. So we continuously played on that line that beer is no different in that way in terms of having the privileges. So the pub was was named the, the tasting room, basically, for the beers. And uh, I think that helped our marketing, and that's where we lead into what would allow us to do that as a brewery. Would you please introduce yourselves? Uh, oh. Good point. Good point. <laughs> let, me, um, yeah, let me do that. I'm sorry. Uh, At the far end, we have uh, Dick Ponzi, who uh, started Bridgeport. Art Lawrence, who started Portland Brewing and now owns uh, 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 Cascade Barrel House. Kurt Widmer, uh, and you know what you know that. My favorite beer, and uh, Brian McManaman. Uh, and Fred Bowman, uh, who also was like a partner in Portland Brewing. And uh, he's now a uh, beer consultant. My name's John Foyston. I write about beer. I've been so, Brett, we're just a bunch of old guys sitting up here. That's right. <laughs> so, That's right. John, to, to uh, continue on kind of level setting what the market looked like 35 years ago. Yeah. So, so um, Rob and I had, uh, I guess, our, our original business plan was we'd have a brew pub and 10 draft accounts, and that was that was the original business plan that we, uh, we formulated. Yeah. And what gave us confidence that there was potential was we saw the, the welcome that Cartwright received, but also when we did our very rudimentary homework from the OLCC report, um, Oregon was one of the highest in percentage of sales states in the country uh, of draft beer, um, which speaks to, in the industry, speaks to a sophisticated beer drinking audience. So Oregon has consistently remained one of the highest in terms of percentage of total beer sales. The other thing was we were, um, Oregon and particularly Portland, was, was one of the highest percentages uh, in terms of imports as a percentage of total sales. And so, um, I have to disagree with Arthur, but uh, Rob and I thought that, that was the segment that we were going to have to compete in, not, not versus the uh, big breweries. No, that, I agree with you. Oh, but we were looking at that same segment of oh, the market. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I misunderstood. So, yeah. so anyhow, well, we thought that, that 
again, our, our ambition was relatively <coughs> modest in retrospect, but uh, we thought we could build a business for, for just the two of us off of that. I should say, my brother sends, sends greetings. He's hosting the <laughs> Oregon Brew Crew tonight at our place. Uh, there's 250 uh, home brewers. We're 36-year 36, members of the club, but, and Rob's hosting them tonight at our place. So, uh, right. and, and home brewers, uh, let's just remember, uh, let's kind of remember the missing man formation. Here. Right. Um, uh, Fred Eckhart was uh, is bless his heart the beer writer who uh, who really he and Charlie Papazian got the uh, the home brewing uh, community going, which is like this huge vibrant community in uh, Oregon and the country. Uh, and uh, the Whitmers, uh, um, you know, do like collaboration beers with the uh, home brewers. Home brewers, uh, Brian would agree, uh, form like the core of Oregon brewers. Um, Jim Kennedy, uh, the yep. late Jim Kennedy, uh, did tastings uh, back in the uh, early 1980s that like, like got people into good beer. Don Younger, the late Don Younger, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, so let's let's have a toast to those, Don to all Younger! those. <laughs> to all those. Yeah. Okay, who wants to uh, who wants to talk about uh, why the brew pub law seemed like a good idea and who started doing it? Because we've kind of edged around this. Mike and I, we were kind of the odd bunch out of the group because we were coming at it from the other angle. We still were. Alive. <laughs> we're seeing that way. Speak up. <laughs> we were pubs, and, and we had started serving these guys as beers, as well as um, you know the, the, the small brew movement, you know, in Northern California. Washington was a little bit ahead, and we were starting to serve those beers. And they were fresh, local, and people were getting excited about that. And uh, you know, the same reasons we've heard here already, but. Uh, and we go, God, we've got, you know, we've got 20 square feet in the back room. We can put a brewery in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or people from McMinnon's out there are going to laugh at that one. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's, let's <laughs> Captain <laughs> Neon's fermentation <laughs> chamber. So, you know, so, yeah, but it, you know, and, and it just, it was, it sounded simple. I mean, obviously it's way more complex, but at the time it worked. Um, we learned a lot. We did a lot of uh, horrible things. Uh, we did a lot of things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, over more time, uh, it worked, but it was really fun. I think we all started the same way, scrapping equipment, because there wasn't an industry that, that made equipment for little people. And uh, so you just kind of had to forge ahead with whatever you could find. And uh, so it was, a lot of, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I remember taking one of our first beers, and it was, no offense, it looked like Whitmer Hefeweizen, and I took, because everybody was drinking Budweiser or Coors or whatever, or Miller, not, not even Coors, Miller, so you, you go out to the bar and you go, okay, we just made this stuff, and uh, we went in and tried it, and it was, we go, <laughs> Nobody's going to drink that, you can't even see through it. It was, just like, it was five years later that Widmer Hefeweizen was the best-selling brand. Yeah. <laughs> it was really fun, because so, yeah, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't know what this would become. This is crazy. And, and Kurt, tell, tell us that story about um, Hefeweizen. You didn't, you didn't even want to release it, right? <laughs> so, um, looking out, there probably are just a small percentage of you that remember the original Dublin pub on Belmont. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Carl and Kate were very early and, and ardent supporters of ours, and um, we struggled at the start. Our first beer was all beer. My mom's family is from Dusseldorf, uh, and. Uh, we thought it was great. Some people still think it's, it was, but but uh, and I'm one of those. Yeah. We had a hard time get, selling that. So uh, and from our homebrew days, we had a wheat beer in the wings. Uh, but we felt that this is '85. That the beer had to look. It didn't have to taste like what people were, were used to drinking, but it should at least look like it because we thought that that was the more professional yeah. presentation. So. Um, 
So Carl had our alt beer, and then he had our bites and beer, which was the, this beer filtered, and um, and it was going well. And actually, we think we started to turn the corner on that one, and, and uh, stopped uh, having to eat uh, beans and franks every for every meal. But uh, we um, so Carl said, uh, "Can you make me a third beer?" And because he was so enthusiastic about what Rob and I were trying to do, that we really wanted to accommodate him, and he, he was a really nice guy. Um, and uh, he's since passed, but he's you know we have great memories of, of Carl. But anyhow. Um, so we only had two fermenters at the time, so a third beer was virtually impossible. And Rob and I have a, a uh, unstated uh, agreement that whoever's not present, the person present gets to take total credit for the idea. So, <laughs> so one day I said, to, I, one day I said to Rob, Rob, let's let's take beer out of uh, the fermenter without passing it through the filter. And he said, you're out of your mind, you know. And, and so we, we did that. We were draft only at that point, so we, it was only supposed to be for Carl. It was only supposed to be two kegs. It was, we were doing it for him, and then he would see that it wasn't going to sell. And, uh, and, and so Carl was this great promoter, and he was the first account in Portland that I know of that had the big 23 ounce Pilsner glasses, the big ones. And uh, so he um, would have his wait staff load up a tray of those with the lemon on the rim and just parade through whether they had, he had an order for him or not. People would, and the great thing about starting in Portland, I mean, this you couldn't have picked a better place to start, but people um, don't need to see it on TV, they don't need to see, hear it on the radio. If they, they see something, they're willing to try it. And I can tell you, there's a lot of places in the U.S. where that's not the case. But in Portland, people would see that and say, man, I need, need to give that a try, you know. And fortunately, they enjoyed it. And then Carl calls the next day and says, well, I need more of this, you know. And we're like, jeez. Uh, and so we had nothing to back it up, no literature, no POS. Uh, but um, it, it, um, in Oregon, if you make beer available for anyone, it must be available for everyone. That's a, that's a state law. And so uh, we, would get, uh, we would get calls. Carl was this great salesman, and, and he was real popular as an after-hours place for, for bartenders around Portland. And um, we would get calls, and people would say, we'd like to carry your beer. And, and Rob and I, not being the sharpest tools in the shop, actually tried to talk people out of it. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, they prevailed, and within about six months, it, it overtook our filtered version, and then within a year, we stopped doing the filtered version completely. Uh, and, uh, so, I'd like to say it was all part of a meticulous plan, but it was just more serendipity. <laughs> and, now, and now you have to go to the brew pub to get all, which, <laughs> that's fine, I'll do that. So, Art, tell us about, um, tell us about the start of Portland Brewing. That was after the uh, the brew pub law had already been passed, be because of your guys' hard work. Oh, you want me to start after the law? But I was going to start no, in Fred's backyard. Don't start with the law. No, I was going to start in Fred's backyard. No. But Please do. Yeah. Pardon me. Start wherever you want. Oh, okay. I, Fred and I went to Hillsborough High School together, and we had a <laughs> mutual friend. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't start with the morning log cabin. <laughs> All right, we'll start at Portland Brewing. 1339 Northwest Flanders, it's now called Road Public House. And that's where we started Portland Brewing in the east part of the Road Public House. And that got started after we had done some home brewing. We, we, drank beer that Fred had been making and said, let's go make some beer. We called Bert Grant up in Yakima and went up there and got an arrangement with him and then sold stock to start Portland Brewing in 1339 Northwest Flanders. And we made three of Bert, Pro Bert Grant's products, his Scottish Ale, his Imperial Stout, and his Winter Ale. We made the Winter Ale first because nobody had drank it in Portland. We, nobody knew what it was really like. Actually, the reason we made the Winter Ale first is because it was Spice Ale, and we had this, all this new brewing equipment, and the stuff had so much flavor, and and, and and it was so unusual that if there were any off flavors in the new metals, I figured nobody's going to notice. That. <laughs> and that was um, what were the ingredients in that? Fred, honey, ginger, nutmeg. Yeah, it had fresh ginger root, uh, nutmeg. Uh, Honey was honey was basically something to fortify the alcohol uh, and, uh, and the fermentables. But uh, uh, I think that was it. 
the memorable experience I have with the winter ale, Fred, was when we brought the distributors over from Portland Distributing, and that was the first beer that they drank, and the sales manager said, well, these guys will get here about 5, and they'll be gone by 6.30 or 7, and about 9.30 or 10, we had to kick them out and went over to Bogart's joint. And what was the alcohol on that winter ale, do you think? Uh, uh, too much. <laughs> I tested it and found it to be too much. <laughs> and then we started making the Grand Scotty Shale, and um, I think Fred made the best, better Grand Scotty Shale than Bert Grant did, and that was kind of the question who made the best <laughs> Grand Scotty Shale. And uh, then came uh, Portland Ale, and then Timberline. Is that right, Fred, in the right order? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> we did Timberline for a uh, in 87, actually, and it was to celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of Timberline Lawn. <laughs> so, um, who wants to talk about um, how the, uh, who came up with the idea, let's, let's go bug the legislature about letting us have brew pubs? Who, who, who would that be? Well, I'll go into that a little bit, because... <clears throat> Again, it was Mike and Brian who, who really had a necessity to get something changed <coughs> so they could make use of that space they had in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and they could uh, harvest those like, like, like a, the operation. yeah, yeah, they could harvest those blueberries <laughs> out in the out in the, the uh, other parking thing lot. That, that always gets me is Brian when he giggles and he says, "Boy, that was fun." I remember <laughs> driving down to the legislature and. Uh, Four of us, I think it was, and they were just we were we were citizen lobbyists. The only experience I had was with the wine business because we had to do something similar in the wine industry so we could do tasting rooms and and keep the taxes down. But I think for Brian and Mike, it was they hated going down there. Number one. And they didn't know who to trust when you got down there because Nobody. all these lobbyists, <laughs> no one, right? Yeah. Right. right, because and pot was not legal at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it. Well, that's what I said. There's two things you never want to see made with sausage and lime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was that was horrifying. I can <laughs> And then I remember driving back. They would say. What the hell happened? I don't know what went on. What, what did we just accomplish? It's this day. I don't even know what happened. <laughs> I, I remember it as being one of the most frustrating times of my life, which ultimately was one of the most satisfying times because we found out you could actually make a change. Well, but when we were, yes. we were down there working on it, and there was so much ignorance in the legislature, and 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 Coors, as someone mentioned earlier, was trying to come in the market at the at the same time, and they were non-pasteurized, and people got uh, confused. Well, there was the pasteurization thing. Well, it was and, a, it was the bottle bill. And the well, Coors, Coors backed up the bottle bill. Yeah, and that was the key thing that anything that went through the legislature that had beer attached to it, the legislators, particularly LBJ, would think that this is a Coors beer in disguise, yeah. you know, and so anything that went across any of the committees, particularly L.B. Day, who was a, a real union guy, and Coors was not union, so our piece of legislation, at one point, we had a, a wonderful piece of legislation, and it was even approved by the distributors, the beer and wine distributors, and we didn't know whether to trust them because when we left we were we were assured that the bill that we had drafted up would be passed and then the next session that was to appear in the hearing room and we're all sitting there waiting for our bill to be read and to give testimony and LB Day tabled the bill and we looked at each other and said, what the hell does that mean? What does that mean, table? So we kept getting out into the corridors and asked everybody we could find, and what it meant was that they weren't going to bring the bill up for vote. So 
points. We thought that was the end of it. And then a halo came over somebody who decided uh, that were not directly involved with the bill that we interacted with down there. And one was the Senate president, who was John Kitzhaber. And another was uh, the Speaker of the House, which was Vera Katz. And, and both of them, as I recall, were, were favorable to what we were trying to do. At least they seemed friendly. Well, they would <laughs> about it. I mean, Kitzhopper would sign the bill if, yeah. if he could get it to And then paper. the third one was uh, Glenn Otto, who was uh, a senator from uh, Troutdale, I believe. Yeah. And I remember watching him having not apparently been paying attention or even present when all this discussion was going in and just came in, sat down and voted against us. And I'm sure he was representing somebody, but it just it just really pissed me off that this guy was not paying attention to anything anybody was saying and he just well, I was so naive. I was Shot us down. That, I was thinking that people actually read the bills. Yeah. How stupid is that? Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was the statement. Read your bill, I had to vote no because somebody called and said it was bad. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what? Um, I, I have to mention. Um, uh, 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 Pete Dunlop is out in the audience, and he might stand up briefly. Uh, his his uh, store his book Portland Beer his book um, Portland Beer uh, very nicely um, I mean it's like a twisted tale and he's he gets it you know he gets it right so you know I could have done that years ago did I do it no I drink beer what can I say? One, one little sidelight I want to I want to mention that Pete's brought out in his book, and, and Tom Mason was here five years ago when we were doing this over at the Baghdad, and he verified this fact that Pete's got in his book. But when all of us were talking about getting legislation and let's go to a senator or a representative, I said, hey, Tom Mason's a friend of mine. He represents me in my district, and I see him at the Multnomah Club from time to time, and Sure enough, I saw him in the shower, and that's where I approached him. <laughs> this all started in the shower. <laughs> now that's a sober up thought. <laughs> this is not, I'm stopping right there. <laughs> Keep that up. And, and I can verify, because I interviewed Tom, he verified that story. Yeah. <laughs> you, you spoke to him in the shower. I think Tom. I think Tom. I think Tom. I think Tom was responsible for attaching our bill. No, no, it was, a, it was not Tom. It was it was a guy from um, Roseburg who did it, who attached it to A13 that had already passed. What was his name? Do you remember? Um, yeah, that's Werner, in your book. Werner, it's in the book, but yeah, yeah, he's from Roseburg. He yeah, Port, uh, Portland Beer by uh, Pete Dunlop. Uh, definitely worth, definitely worth uh, buying. One, one, maybe we're going to approach. You got a question? One thing that we're going to approach maybe is why Oregon? Why did it start here? And and, and there's a number of people here, and, and and I would like to throw my two cents in off. You ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers, but there's many answers of why we succeeded. Not necessarily in the right order, but one, the retailers found out they could make money on, off of us. We could, they could upgrade. That's one of the keys. That's not a, another one, these people that were doing it were entrepreneurs, they were experienced, and they're still here in the business today, 30 years later. So that's another reason. <laughs> Another reason they were capitalized adequately, or they wouldn't be sitting here. They made good beer. <laughs> I can remember when Fred and I were putting together our brewery, I went out to Hillsborough to get some gas out of the gas station. I had a little sticker on the side of my truck that said Portland Ale, and this old boy went, Portland Ale, I never heard of that beer. I said, well, Fred Bowman and I from Hillsborough started the brewery, and he said, you make good beer, kid, people will drink it. <laughs> I think it's about that simple, right? You make good beer, people will drink it. So that's another reason I think we've succeeded. And I think that Kurt identified another important thing that's not necessarily the priority, 
but we're adventuresome here in Oregon. We will go patronize our local people. Let me go try it. And Kurt's experienced it around the country where people maybe turned their nose up. Around here, we're, yeah, I'll give it a try. Yeah, I'll give it a try. It was evidenced when they were selling their Hefeweizen. So that's another reason why we succeeded. Yeah, we go grow, grow hops in this area. That may be part of it. And a lot of it, like Dick just mentioned earlier about uh, draft beer, 16 to 20% of the beer sold in Oregon historically had been draft. It was easier to get into draft than bottles. And that was kind of paved, by the way, of Weinhardt's Lucky Miller. And the weather. And the weather. <laughs> now we come in, I guess, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the wintertime. We're not, it's dark, rainy. We're going to come inside. Yeah. We're a tavern business. We're yeah. tavern oriented. Yeah. California. California, I think when we used to look at the statistics, it's probably increased then, but they were maybe 1 or 2% draft. We were 16 to 20. Huh. It's a six pack to the beach. We're, let's go to the tavern and have a beer. That, and it was easier for us, like, like Fred mentioned, I think it was about Corey, or maybe it was Kurt mentioned about Corey getting into bottles versus draft. If you yeah. might have gotten into draft, it might have been an opportunity for him to see it. To see it. Yeah. So those are some of the reasons. There's probably other reasons why we've succeeded. But I think the reason that we succeeded is because the people are sitting up here are still around today and have good, sound business knowledge to start with. Well, well the other thing I, the other thing I, was, I was, Where did you get your million? Where did you get your million to start? What I was going to say that, 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 that kind of goes along with that, and I, and I think that uh, we all got going, but one of the things that really made it uh, gather momentum a lot sooner than it uh, would have otherwise is we were all starting up at, at roughly the same time and so there were all of us out knocking on doors trying to sell our beers and it didn't look like just one crazy going out there doing it it, it was a movement so it was five crazies yeah yeah so so and we were all making good beer so I think that caused it to grow a lot faster than it would have otherwise um, so uh, the, the brew pub law made Oregon into Bruvana. I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, it would not have happened otherwise. Um, sitting out in the audience, we have uh, uh, Stuart Ramsey, who uh, uh, ran the uh, ran the Bridgeport Brew Pub. Maybe he would tell us briefly what it was like uh, running that brew pub in the early days. Um, or maybe he wouldn't. I don't know. <laughs> he might he might be sullen, you know. Ponzi hired me. Uh, it was a tasting room. That's right. But uh, I, I had other ideas. Uh, I grew up in Scotland and uh, worked in the pubs in Glasgow. And I wanted the Bridgeport Brew Pub to be this uh, hybrid um, sort of gathering place where it was like a Glasgow pub where they never have stools at the bar. Because drinking is serious, and you have to stand when you're <laughs> so, so it was a, it, there was this Glasgow connection. Um, but also, I wanted, I did a deal with uh, Powell's Books. Where, and Dick doesn't know this, but we traded uh, for books. And the only books I wanted was Russian and Irish authors. <laughs> uh, and we had a, a whole bunch of magazines. So it was this kind of a coffee house gathering place. Uh, Austria, Glasgow, hybrid, and it was, just, it was a vision. And uh, the brilliant thing was, it was in the Pearl, which used to be called Northwest Industrial. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember the old days? Uh, you know, and we just got this phenomenal group of people just <coughs> discovering this place. Everybody from Will Benton to Bud Clark, you know, the mayor of and uh, all the architects in Portland, all the points in Portland. And it just, it triggered something. And uh, it was, uh, I'm just really grateful to, you know, have had that opportunity to create that in the space of, you know, you create. Stuart, I thought when Bridgeport went down there, they were on the other end of the world 
Going clear from Flanders, clear down to Marshall? Way down to Marshall? Good golly! That's beyond industrial. Yeah! <laughs> And, and speaking of other brilliant brew pubs, let's let's talk about uh, the first Portland Brewing Pub. Yeah, like uh, 1339 Northwest Flander. I mean, that's what a great place. It was. It was. Uh, it, we you know, when we first started planning it, uh, Art found the the uh, space actually, and it had been an architectural sign company. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is ideal. It's got floor drains in it. Already. <laughs> they called it a glory hole. For yeah, you. well, that was a great part. But anyway, it had, it had floor drains, and so you could wash it down. This is something that uh, I, uh, I, I went and talked to uh, Ken Grossman, who was the founder of Sierra Nevada, and I said, What do you look for in a building? The first thing he says is floor drains. You've got to be able to wash it down. And, uh, it's not cheap, I know that one. Yeah. And so we had this building, which we thought was adequate size-wise, which proved to be ridiculous <laughs> later, but but it was on four levels, which allowed a very traditional layout for a brewery. You do gravity levels, you have store your materials upstairs and everything proceeds down uh, downhill uh, without using pumps and so on. So it was great for that. Uh, it had the floor drains. It, it, it had been uh, the, the Holly Dairy in 1929, which is why it was set up that way. And uh, it was right next to a pub called uh, Bogart's. And uh, so uh, I thought it was a, a great building and it took us a while to, to uh, arrange things to get in there, but uh, it was uh, in, the, in the right neighborhood too. You, you might wonder why all three of us started up in the same neighborhood. Um, we were on either side of 14th, Northwest 14th. Uh, Bridgeport was at 14th and Marshall. Whitmer was at 14th and um, Lovejoy. And Portland Brewing was at uh, 14th and Flanders. Well, it was the only zone in the city of Portland where you could put a brewery without a conditional use permit because there was already a brewery in the neighborhood. So it, it worked out, I mean, that's why we all ended up there, but it worked out to our advantage later on anyway, because if one of us was running out of some material, you could run down the street and borrow it from somebody else, you know? And, and uh, so it was, uh, it, was, it was great. And we were also, because of our proximity, we were able to uh, order bulk malt in, uh, in, the, in the early days, we were too small to get uh, a, a full order. So we could we could uh, share our ordering and save some money on shipping. So it was it was good. Yeah. And Brian, tell us a little bit about uh, Captain Neon's fermentation chamber <laughs> <laughs> because I you guys Mike, are. I should be here for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, again, it was a really small brewery operation. Uh, we just wanted to brew own beer because we we're selling stuff now that was fresh and right. local and, and uh, we'd run around town uh, in our van looking for, uh, we ended up with a bunch of old dairy tanks, uh, running down to Tulumuk, uh, grabbing stuff for cheap. Uh, we built it from scratch, had no idea really where it was going to go and talking about running out of space. Let me just oh, interject my. here. We, we now have like uh, some of the best stainless steel fabricators in the world in yeah, Portland, we but we didn't then. <laughs> no, we, we had to invent ways to do it on the scale. We were doing a really small scale. This, you heard we didn't have the room, and uh, the, the cook wasn't going to give up the room. So it was, uh, you yeah, know, we had open fermenters. Uh, probably not a good idea when you're brewing in the kitchen. <laughs> It's the things you learn along the way. <laughs> well, that cheeseburger beer. Well, I, I, I mean, that was good. Yeah. But I mean, going back, those are the early days. And we were, we were all experimenting. We are all trying things. You know, you put, I mean, you were talking about honey and, and some of the things you put in a beer, be it too strong or not enough. But you don't know because there's no book written about that on that level. So you experiment. And uh, we still love doing it to this day. We still love keeping it small. 
Uh, we do have a larger brewery at Edgefield, but we like the small. It, it's easy to understand and get your hands around it from a, from a customer standpoint, maybe. Um, yeah, it is just, it, we've stayed with that. Uh, but we had a lot of fun at Hillsdale doing it, getting it started. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was crazy. I remember guys from, we had a tasting uh, after looking through the cloudy beer. We had the guys from Blitz. Uh, I, I won't mention names, but they came out to sample our beer. And they left completely satisfied that we were never going to be a threat. <laughs> They're gone, and we're still here. And I should I should mention that uh, McMenamins just racked off keg one million. So we keep doing okay. That was last uh, last Wednesday. I think. Yes, it was a lot of yeah, there's. There's some guys here in the room, you can't see them with the lights, but uh, who kept track, because every guys were racking and trying to hold off or speed up. Because <laughs> it was a good deal, actually, one man cakes, so it's pretty fun. And so, yeah. it ended up being one of our new brewers up at Roy Street up in uh, yeah. Washington. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of fun, but it was, it was a great time. Uh, they used to have a sign out in front of your place. What was right? That? Batch number. Batch number, there you go. <laughs> That's good. And how long did you run that? Uh, we were there at Love Jay for almost five years, and I think the last batch was in the thousands, you know, so. I, I remember going to my first uh, Master Brewers Association meeting uh, with Bert Grant, and uh, I, I think Carl Elkert might have been there also, but uh, we had maybe three of us people there and the rest of the room was filled with people from Rainier and from Blitz Weinhardt and from Lucky and 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 there were a lot of them and there were very few of us and I think I, I remember them looking at us like we were some from other planet or something and, and thinking that we were somewhat of a joke and today if you go to a, a Master Brewers Association meeting the Northwest uh, region is one of the most active and largest in the in the United States, and all of those people that were kind of thinking we were a joke are gone. <laughs> so. Um, so uh, um, I will. Uh, we're probably at the end of our time. Um, let me uh, let me just uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll have a question and answer here right now. Uh, let me point out that um, uh, they are pouring um, very pertinent beers, uh, Max Amber, uh, Bridgeport IPA, uh, Cascade Portland Ale, and um, uh, there are like, uh, there are several McMenamin's ales on, uh, on tap, including Hammerhead, which is a lovely beer. The one that uh, uh, John Harris like uh, first converted to a uh, all malt brew from uh, from extract. Um, yeah, yeah, and Widmer Hef Hefeweizen, which is of course the uh, you know like the the flagship brew of uh, of uh, Widmer and a lovely beer, even though it's not all. I mean, <laughs> but who can convince about that? Um, so if folks have questions, uh, please, uh, please ask them now. Absolutely perfect drinking water. I mean, as it comes, 
we take the chlorine out of it. That's yeah. right. And Yay. it's absolutely perfect the way it is. And, and we know from experience, we have a brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have one in Hawaii. We have to spend lots of money to uh, make that, that water uh, perfect for brewing, but uh, we're taking out minerals and things like that. But Bull Run is absolutely fantastic water. Yeah. information. Um, I know that wasn't the case in Northern California, talking to some of the folks down there, and I can't speak. Well, we did, we did a lot of work with the guys up in Washington, too, uh, some of the brewers. But, I, you know, we all got along. We still do. We're all sitting here together. And uh, we've had a great time together. And I, would, and I think any of us would share a beer with any of the rest of the team uh, at any time. It's been it's been great. I mean, we, nobody it's knew. It's been a nobody good ride. Knew, nobody knew what was going on. Well, that's what I think made your success, which is what, what you guys are doing. That's a great observation. We, um, it's, it's been, for, for Rob and I, one of the more rewarding things is, is that we can agree to compete very, very vigorously in the marketplace, and we do. There's no more competitive marketplace for beer than, than Portland, Oregon. But, but we're all whatever, we can set that aside and have a beer together and, and, and do things that of, of common interest like legislative issues and, and zoning issues and things like that. So, but, and, and as Brian said, I mean, that doesn't happen everywhere across the U.S. I mean, we have one of the oldest operating brewers guilds, um, I, don't, I think it's 25 years now, uh, and uh, that, that, that doesn't happen across the country. I mean, and we work to promote beer in Oregon and on a mutual benefit basis. So that's a great observation. Yeah, I mean, it's been really fabulous to work with these knotheads, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another, reason, another reason we got along was in those days we all had a couple spigots sticking out of our coolers. <laughs> so when you went down to somebody else's brewery, yeah. Kurt and Rob didn't have a pub on 14th and Lovejoy. Dip did, and Fred and I did up on Flanders, but we still had taps coming out of our coolers. I went down to get some malt, or Fred went down to get some malt, and we had some beer, had a beer. Dude. The other thing that I enjoyed about going down to Kurt and Rob's was meeting their dad, Ray. Now, Fred's and my dad's had passed away when we were building our brewery. Going down to visit with Ray was, First class guy. was a you. great. That's very kind of you. We all love Ray. Uh, you had to go down to the, uh, the horse grass on Friday for Poets which stood for, piss on everything, tomorrow's Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the words go. And it's like, uh, I, I mean, I swear to God, I mean, I've been covering this, uh, 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 this world for 25 years, and it's like, there are so, there are so, so few buts. I mean, everything, everybody is like a, like a really lovely person. Let me Somebody, just say one I, mean, I think it was the, uh, one of the guys on the East Coast said uh, craft beer is 99% asshole free. Right. <laughs> so, one thing I will say is I appreciate what you guys have said for the last 30 years, right? Or what have you, but I'm sure everybody's tasted uh, Stevens beer that you sample right, right now. And so, how do you encourage new brewers, I guess, to have that same passion? and then for the next 30 years, right? And not get discouraged that Bridgeport's already here, McMinnon's already here, Portland Brewing, you know, and all these brewers have already been established in Portland, but they still get that passion and get the new creations and keep that passion going for them. Like, how would you then now pass the torch and encourage the younger brewers to keep on? I'd like to answer that. Uh, first of all, they don't need a whole lot of encouragement. Uh, they've seen what's happened. 
and there are new people starting up all the time. And in in my work as a as a consultant, I'm I help them get through some of the pitfalls. Uh, I think we made uh, most of the mistakes, <laughs> so I know how to do that. And uh, and so. But how do you encourage them to make more mistakes? Well, you know, if you're not making honestly, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. You're not doing anything, really. So. Uh, it, it it's pretty easy. Uh, I don't think the business is as easy to get into as it uh, as it once was. Uh, it's easier than it was when we started because there are people now that make equipment that you can actually use. As someone mentioned a little while ago, I mean we have all these equipment manufacturers around here now. When we when we all began, uh, you had to adapt things from other. Uh, types of business or design things yourself and have someone fabricate them. Uh, it was a lot of invention and now you don't have to do that. You can buy a, a turnkey brewery from a company that is very uh, competent and knows what they're doing and they'll train you to operate it. So it's gotten a bit easier in that respect. It's gotten a bit harder in that uh, there's a lot of competition out there so you really have to do something uh, to set yourself apart. Um, so it has it has changed, but it doesn't seem to to really uh, dissuade a lot of people from from getting into it. Yeah, I think um, I'd like to relate my experiences because I started in the wine business and did the beer business and then back to the wine business. And to answer your question up there why we were so successful in both of those industries was the journey that we all took, whether you were in the brewing business or in the wine business. It started from very humble beginnings and we were dealing in the wine business with a grape that was unknown. In the brewing business we were dealing in a, in a, 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 a beer that was virtually unknown by the the major public and so we had to gang together to present our wares and uh, it wasn't always received very well so it was this continual sharing of information whether it was marketing or whether it was in the process so that we could all be successful and I think in the early days you realize that as a lone ranger out there you wouldn't have much success. And so we ganged together in the wine industry and there was a half a dozen people going nationally trying to promote Pinot Noir. And in the beer business, it was just a group of people who realized changing the law could make a significant difference. And that journey really bound people together. And when a new brewery opens up, they have to feel that kind of attachment that you may be competing, but really the bigger picture is to work together and perfect the product because perfecting of the product will help everybody. A bad beer out there does not add anything to the marketing or to the reputation of beers. So you want to point out flaws if you see flaws in beers, not as a criticism, but as a, as a support so that the beer industry will, will continue to grow. And the beer industry is a little different than the wine industry in that it's become important to be a pub because a pub now is, is the focus. And a pub can be very unique but still support and be part of the community of beer making. To go out nationally, we found out early, uh, Whitmer's have been very successful in going nationally, but when we started distributing Bridgeport in California, you know, we originally started as a regional beer. We wanted to be uh, regional. We wanted to have our identification, but when we ended up in California trying to show that we were a regional beer from, Cal from Oregon, that was kind of, you know, a, a conflict of, of statements. So we realized that the strength is in the pub 
and that's what's happening, I think, because of that. You don't have to go national to, to show your wares and to be successful. Right. Lo local beer, I mean, it's coming back to you. Remember that uh, PGE um, uh, tried to get a license for a nuclear power plant at Pebble Springs. <laughs> They were so confident that they were going to receive their operating license that they, they commissioned to have the tanks fabricated. And then the regulatory agency said, no, that this, we don't like your design, and so it never happened. And so, um, fortuitously enough for Rob and I, um, we used to spend a lot of time in, in scrapyards. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we were up at, uh, I think we, were at, we, we located the first one at Schnitzer. And these tanks were um, built to nuclear spec, <laughs> they were, um, they were, uh, what's the highest grade? Is it, it's not 306, what's the higher grade of stainless? 315. So, 316. 316. 316. 316. So these were all 316, that the domes were like three quarters of an inch and the walls were like a quarter of an inch of beautiful stainless steel. And um, they, I'm sure that, uh, you know, all to nuclear specs, so they were probably half a million to a million dollars each, and we bought it for scrap. <laughs> We, we, cut, we cut the head off of one and um, turned that into a barbecue for home, but the, uh, <laughs> we, we fired the bottom of that one. Uh, we had to gut them because they had all kinds of interesting uh, devices inside, again, all stainless. So, but we, we gutted those. Uh, we, we gutted one and made our hot water tank, and then we gutted another one and made a, 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 um, a bright beer tank out of that. So um, we didn't advertise the fact that we were using nuclear tanks, you know, but, uh, but that, that got out. But uh, they, that brewery, uh, we sold it to a kid that had gone to Reed, and he took it back to Vermont, to uh, Otter Creek. And then uh, he outgrew it, and it came back to Arizona. I think the brewery is called Nimbus. I'm not sure if it's still in operation. But, uh, so that, 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 that brewery is, has been back and forth across the country, and those nuclear tanks will be here long <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Biniman, and, and first of all, just thank you so much for all you've done with the historical buildings all throughout yeah. the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. 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 I really enjoy uh, that, and my wife and I do, and I know obviously a lot of us do. <laughs> and then the other question, uh, or the question is, about three or four years ago, I'm not exactly sure on the time frame, you released your brewers to brew what they felt like brewing uh, in their own area. So we're in the East Vancouver uh, pub, and we hit there at least once a week. I've probably bought all sorts of stuff for your family and friends. And um, so I was just curious, uh, what went behind the decision making in that process? What was the decision making process in that? And, and uh, how do you feel about it so far? I mean, I've really enjoyed uh, the new, you know, every other week or so, there's something new to try. What the guys have made out there, and here and there, and it's just, it's great. I love it. So, what, what went behind that? I know there's a bunch of guys holding their breath in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we had a. This is really silly. And looking back, of course, you know, you have, you you create a bonus system to reward your brewers for doing the right things. One of them is cost control. And we realized at a point that, that was incredibly silly, <laughs> and um, we cut them loose. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, it was great. I mean, thank you for, for noticing that. I, I, we didn't, you know, you you get caught up in the bigger business of the of the whole thing. And uh, no, it was really nice to to uh, go. I mean, they're artists. Let them date. So. Um, it, it, in, in you know hindsight, it's, it's a pretty stupid idea to, but you know we learn. We're still learning. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I think I think the brewers are having a fabulous time now and uh, run, run, run. So and I think it's great, and I think it's great now that that there's a whole new generation coming up of people that are opening breweries and experimenting. Just to go back to another question. Uh, because our parents all grew up drinking Oli or Bud or whatever, and now these kids that are opening the brew pubs now are kids that grew up with their parents 
drinking, you know, Sierra Nevada, McMinimins, Widmer, Bridgeport. It's awesome. So, but thanks for recognizing that. And uh, yeah. yeah, Brian, yeah. Brian, can I? Um, so what what they've done is they've they've kicked some really good brewers upstairs, like uh, Graham Brogan and Jeff Cooley, and um, back in the uh, back at the uh, uh, the beer uh, the beer thing there, you have the uh, A team from uh, Crystal Brewing, which is like Stephen and Drew. Um, Beers out at, I mean, uh, you know, the beers out at like Cornelius Pass Roadhouse and uh, a number of other places. I mean, they're really emphasizing their beers. And like, I swear, you know, like like people like slag off McMenamin's beers, but you're you're, you know, it's just wrong because they're making some great beers. They used to say we're a restaurant, not a brewery. They don't say that anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bless their hearts. Should we just shut up? Up top. Up here. Up here. Up here. Right. Okay, so uh, to Brian. So, you know, I, the Anderson School is uh, coming online here quickly, so obviously you need another project, right? That's basically what you're going to do. So, uh, I have a suggestion. You know, the Kellogg Middle School on 69th and Powell. It's humongous. And Marshall High School. It's so much closer to my house than everybody in our house. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have this, enough time to get into that. This, <laughs> this is like when uh, people yell out requests at like a Richard Thompson concert. <laughs> Thank you, though. similar to that and usually we're not here in Portland when we're asked that question and so what I point out to people if, if, let's say I'm sitting in Dubuque Iowa or something like that and I'm asked that question is, is uh, Oregon is not a wealthy state um, it's not and uh, the fact that that we lead the country in percentage of beer that's craft the nationwide average is just over eight and we're just over 17 I think uh, so and, uh, so twice the national average, and, and so when people ask, you know, so what do you, is there an end to all this? I mean, honestly, it is terrifying to me that 1.7 breweries open someplace in the U.S. every day. And that makes me, that concerns me. But on the other hand, I can point to the fact that the rest of the country indexes half of what Oregon is, and there's a whole lot of wealthier states and parts of the country than the state of Oregon. And so my pat answer is, if it can happen in Oregon, why can't it happen across the country? So uh, that gives me hope for the future. <laughs> That's how I sleep at night, anyhow. <laughs> yeah. And the, the 0.7 uh, part of that would be scary, because like, would they only have like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one of our... Right, <laughs> right. That would, that would be hard to keep the beer in the fermenter. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I was at Red 
Freddie around, Freddie, the passport stamp about oh, a couple months ago. <laughs> I had enough to do that day. And I went to some beer on the west side of Portland, and I tasted this great beer by a woman brewer. I think it was called Good Dog Blue, or Old Dog Good Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh! Cascade Brewing in 86, we had been envious of Wigmer Hefeweizen, of Black Bean Porter, of McTarnahan's, Bridgeport Ale. Everybody had their driver beer, their one beer that kind of really set them out. And when we started at the Raccoon Lodge, I'd been out of the business for four plus years after leaving Portland Brewing and the market had changed. Ron Gansberg came from Bridgeport to Portland Brewing to Raccoon Lodge. We had brand new equipment. It's like starting a kitchen with brand new pots and pans, starting with a new recipe. And in the four years that it took us from when I left Portland Brewery I got started, the market had changed dramatically. Whitmer's had gotten bigger. The shoots had come on. Full sale had come on. Mike and Brian had expanded. And it wasn't like I could just go downtown and go talk to my friends and get another tap. It wasn't that easy anymore. And so we kept looking for our magic elixir work. How can we stand out? And then in 07, 08, the market started changing a little bit and we were trying to, we were scratching our heads and going, how can we expand without spending any money and what can we do with local resources? Oh, we got wine barrels here. We're in Dick Ponzi country. We got wine barrels. <laughs> they cut them in half and turn them into planters. <laughs> Sell them for $30 or $20 at Buy Mart. <laughs> what can we do with a wooden barrel? Well, the last frontier that was out there was the sour beer realm or the wild yeast beers. And so we took a chance. That was the last frontier. It was the most expensive frontier to get into, the least known about, and it takes the longest. These beers age for a year to a year and a half, so it's very capital intensive. And you've got a bacteria in your brewery that you don't want to have in your brewery for a long period of time. We, today was Thursday at the Raccoon Lodge, and so we, we infected um, 25 wine barrels today. And they got hauled out to our third facility in Beaverton and then commenced six hours of brewery cleansing. And that happens every week. So Kurt doesn't want to get into that right now. They have to have kind of another facility. He doesn't want to get this, we use lactobacillus. 
in infecting his other beers. So it's a frontier that's out there, but you have to invest in that frontier. And we took a chance years ago, and we didn't know what we were, where we were doing. The first beer we made was a creek. And Ron had gone out and picked cherries. We aged it for a year. We put uh, two or three cases in the back of our truck and drove to Denver during the Great American Beer Festival. We weren't even there. We went down to um, Falling Rock, and I used Fred Bowman's name to meet Chris Black, because I'd never <laughs> met Chris Black. But Fred knew Chris Black. And I used Fred's name, and oh, come on in, bring a case of beer in here. It's 10.30 in the morning, let's have a beer. <laughs> You've never heard this story, Fred. No. <laughs> We brought the beer in and we started drinking beer in the morning at Chris Black's place and he started in, because Denver is kind of a wild west town for those of you that have gone to the Great American Beer Festival. And so then we brought the beer in, we started drinking it and then um, the next day we came back again and I, we had it in my truck and I had parked in a two hour time zone down the street and every two hours I was running down to go feed the meter. And, <laughs> And then I had to go move my truck, and I tried to start it, and it wouldn't start. The battery was dead. Here it was, 5 o'clock Friday night. I go back to the Falling Rock and go, Ron, i got to get my truck towed. Let me take some more beer into it. And he was talking to these two brothers named the Alstrom brothers. And they're going, who are you? Where are you from? What's your name? And they were drinking this creek. And that was our first validation that weekend down there at Denver that we were making this creek because we would take beer around Portland and people would go, oh, that's infected. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It's supposed to be. <laughs> and so we got our validation back there, then, and the next year we went back and won a third place at Great American Beer Festival with our creek. The next year we went back into first and second in the wood barrel aged sour category, and we don't go anymore. We stay home, we spend the money to buy equipment, and go drink our beer. So we took a risk and jumped out and we got in front of the curve on our sour beer. Um, it looks like from what we're told we're making more sour beer than Cantillon is making right now in Belgium. Um, we're shipping beer to Netherlands this month. We, were in, we sell our, our sour beer in Florida, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, Rhode Island. We're expanding into Texas. Colorado, we're in Nevada, British Columbia, we do Oregon and Washington ourselves, we have two distributors in California, and we ship to Hawaii, and we've got, we're meeting with some Japanese people in the next week or so, so we're probably going to be shipping some over there. We're kind of maxed out right now. We produced 3,400 barrels last year at Cascade Brewing. We sold 1,700 barrels, so half of it went into aging. We have a new building in Beaverton that we've expanded into this year. Uh, we, we can go expand Cascade Brewing and add three more fermenters and go from about 3,400 barrels to or a little over 5,000 annual production and then that maxes out that particular building. And it's a 10 barrel system, yeah. And, it's, and I want to give tribute to Nick Ponzi for discovering Ron Gansberg. <laughs> well, uh, I, I wanted to uh, say that uh, I had been in Belgium uh, for, uh, uh, and, vi and visited a number of breweries, some of them ancient, and came back not at, long after that and visited the cast. Gate Barrel House, and Ron gave me some tastes of some things that he was doing. And I said, my God, he's nailed it. I mean, he's just, it was, it was just like what I had experienced in Belgium. And so it was exciting. Thank you. Um, why I got the floor one minute. When, when, I want to back up 30 years, 31, 32 years, when Fred and I were getting started. Maybe Kurt did the same thing. Fred and I went to Don Younger. Yeah. Don, what do you think? What do you think about this? We're thinking about doing a brewery. And what did Don say, Fred? Remember? Um, I don't remember his exact words. Well, he probably, he probably said fucking A. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> Something like that. This was in the smoking days of that, but <laughs> did you go to talk to Don about your idea at all to get some validation of what you're doing, Kurt? Mm, 
fairly early on, yeah. yeah. We were going did you talk to him? Absolutely. Yeah, you guys probably talked to Don too. I wish Don was here with us. I know he is. And let's do a little toast to our friend, Don Yonder. The Tavern Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, heart of, the heart of Oregon beer. Did I answer your question about sour beers? <laughs> More than necessary. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, we, we've probably gone on long enough. Um, if, if you guys are ready for the movie, um, uh, let us know. Uh, otherwise, yeah. There, there is going to be a movie here on uh, the Monday after. The, is that what you're talking about? John? No, I'm talking about um, Birvana is going to show well, right Birvana's tonight. Okay. But um, there's going to be like uh, on uh, July 27. There's going to be like a uh, um, a movie of like the like the Dutch Brewers. It all starts with beer. That'll be here. But tonight. Um, they're going to show uh, Birvana by uh, Beth Harrington. Yeah, that, this is the Dutch Brewers that came over the Oregon Brew Festival last year, and it starts in the Netherlands, and with them preparing right. their beer, and it was help sponsored by the City of Utrecht as well as the Brewers Festival. I'm anxious to see it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.